Thank you for joining us for another Reunited, where our goal is to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. My name is Corey Pritchard. Uh, looks like we have my wife, Bridget Pritchard, here on the line, uh, Pastor Mark Dwayne Burroughs. Uh, we also have uh, Emerson Winfield Jr. Uh, on, the, on the line, and we're going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, we are transitioning or have transitioned uh, out of uh, becoming a law abiding citizen, the kingdom of God. If you haven't made the opportunity to listen to any of that, I would highly advise that you do. Uh, a lot of those things would be very foundational uh, to helping to really be able to grasp the things that we'll be getting into tonight. Uh, we actually recorded part one of our, our new, I guess, umbrella or series, which is effective and efficient stewardship in God's kingdom. And we went through part one, more or less just trying to transition out of uh, our last lesson. And I am, I always say it, but I mean, I'm like, I'm so, so excited. Uh, so I'm just going to share uh, what I've learned. Uh, so that's uh, so a number of things I'm learning and, uh, and getting into this, it's going to be a case where, where we're really going to learn, uh, I believe stewardship from a more sound perspective. I I'll say, uh, not that we have never heard of it or never learned it, but I believe that we're really going to go back to, to try to uh, established, I believe, the foundation, I believe, that we should have got from the beginning that we probably never got in dealing with why. Uh, when I say why, it's a case for, for many people that come to Christ or an awareness of Christ, a relationship with Christ uh, or God uh, through Christ, then the challenge is, is that why? Like, you know, once you have been saved, you know, confess hope and faith in Jesus Christ, baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, now what? Like, what is my daily life about what is my walk like what is it that i'm supposed to do what is my role what is my function what is my purpose so nights like tonight are really going to start to really put those things into into position i believe the way that god uh, wants those to be so i'm just excited about it so i said i would open this up so i'm going to ask uh is there anyone here that would like to say anything any comments any questions anything before we actually get into the material for tonight All right. All right. And again, you always can jump in at any point. I'm going to highly recommend that if someone is listening to this recording, uh, this is definitely going to be one where you're going to have to uh, uh, make notes. OK, I did jam pack it with a number of things. Sometimes I may uh, allude to some things I don't really go into in detail. This time I will go into more detail. Uh, so if it is a case where, you know, you feel like you need some time to kind of make it slow down. No big deal. Just be willing and ready. Make the time to go back and listen to the recording because it's going to be very vital for times like tonight. Just as if just a lot of rich uh, content and a lot of concepts that you're going to have to have some time to really uh, deal with. OK, uh, so with that being said, uh, if you he if you are here live, I know Pastor Burroughs, you're driving. My wife is probably doing something with the kids. A lot of different things going on. Get what you can get. OK get what you're able to get but again make time to go back to the recording where you can make time to actually really di di to digest uh what's being said because i don't want anyone to miss anything again these are things that are going to help us as we're continuing on and this is this is applicable right so, so today tonight okay uh, tomorrow these are things that we should begin to apply and be able to transition to help us really get more out of our relationship with god and us the citizens of the citizens of the kingdom of God. Okay. So with that being said, okay, then uh, what I'd like to do is have us start with Genesis chapter one. So this is absolutely uh, awesome. Okay. So we're just going to get, get right into it. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you to get there. And uh, the first verse that I'd like for us to look at is in Genesis one is verse number 10. Okay. And that's amazing that we're going to pick out the same concept. Okay. It's the same concept. And, and we've seen it before, but I think it's going to it's going to be a why. OK, why is this important? So Genesis chapter one, verse number 10 reads, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. OK, so I, you see there I put a, an underline there. So make note again, God saw that it was good. OK. So that was the first day. Now look at Genesis chapter one, verse number 12. And it reads, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And what do we see again? 
and God saw that it was good. Okay. This would be, I believe, the second day. Okay. Now let's go down to verse number 18. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Okay. So you can see this track that God saw that it was good. Okay. Go down to verse number 21. And again, God does not waste words. Okay. So that's the reason why it's important to pull these out. In verse 21 reads, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every wing fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. OK, we see that now let's look at verse number 25. OK, and again, that consistency and verse 25 reads and God made the beast. Of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Right. We see that consistency. So each day that God is creating. Right. God is looking back over what he has said and he is seeing that it was good. And I hope that makes sense. OK. And let's look at verse number 31. OK. And pay attention to what is said here in verse number 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Do we see that? And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay. And it's, it's a powerful thing to see the way that this is working out because God says again, after each step, each day, he says, good, 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 good. And then after uh, on the sixth day, now God says, very good. Okay. So here's the note. I'm asking, what is God's doctrine about what he did on earth in six days? OK, so again, just just kind of stay with me. So I'm asking this a very specific question. So as we've been dealing with things, dealing with the parables of Jesus Christ and dealing with becoming a law abiding citizen, in the kingdom of God, then then the reality for myself is that God has a doctrine. Right. So for me, it's been shaking me up because now I realize I'm not really as excited about seeking any individual's doctrine if it's not the doctrine of God. Right. If it's not the doctrines of Jesus Christ, I'm not nearly as interested as I used to be. OK, not that it's not good, but I'm just not as interested. So when I'm looking at at, 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 at scriptures like these, now I realize I am listening to God's doctrine. So, again, my, my question is. What is God's doctrine about what he did on earth in those days? OK, so the next question I had is. What did God teach us? OK, so what is he teaching us? What is his doctrine? And then what is he teaching us? OK, what did God say? And what I pointed out here is that according to what God said is that he says what it was good i hope that makes sense and any comments any questions before i actually get into good and we look at we'll look at good okay and i hope everybody's uh, tracking with me but again feel free to jump in at any point if you need to but i'll continue on so what i'm pulling out here is again this is about not the perspective that we have had or that we have been given but it is the correct perspective and we should seek to see it the way that god saw it if that makes sense so god says good okay so i myself wanted to get a better idea of what good is because when i'm dealing with the idea of good good just sounds like okay right in comparison to great or awesome or fantastic right or all these other words then good doesn't seem that exciting but when we look at the uh, bible concordance is what i looked at the Hebrew word that they that they use to translate this good is the word tov, right? And you can take a look at that if you would like to uh, on your own. 
But here's the things that that help me. Again, I'm studying and I'm learning. I'm just sharing what what I've learned. The ways that it's been translated is good. Okay. Also translated in some places better. Translated well. Translated goodness. Okay. Translated as goodly. Best. Merry. Fair. Prosperity. Precious. Fine. Wealth beautiful fairer favor glad right you can see that and then here's some some idea of, of them trying to give a, a translation or some translations for what this word would be okay here's some words they use good pleasant agreeable pleasant agreeable pleasant uh in parentheses they have to the higher nature good excellent in parentheses of its kind good rich valuable in estimation good appropriate becoming better and it has parentheses comparative glad happy prosperous of man's sensuous nature is in is in parentheses good understanding in parentheses of man's intellectual nature uh good kind benign right i thought was very interesting okay for people that deal with the medical profession that word benign good right in parentheses is ethical a good thing benefit welfare and again more welfare prosperity happiness good things and in parentheses collective good benefit and then also moral good okay welfare benefit good things uh looks like welfare prosperity happiness good things and then parentheses collective and then bounty so anyone that's ever spent any time dealing with any bible concordance it's a case where depending on the scripture the verse that you're looking at then it will help to be able to get an idea where it fits it but this is just a broad view of having a better understanding when we see this hebrew word what we should try to pull out of it right so again it's not just a good it's <laughs> just as a okay this is really a, a, a really high thing in the way that God is seeing it and saying that it's good. I hope that makes sense. And the root word that this was actually comes from was weird. It's the same word. It's still told. OK, but here's some other words that they use to translate that. It is uh, well, good, please, goodly, better, cheer, comely, uh, looks like do. And then we also have pleased okay and then it looks like the way that they've actually tried to give some definitions for for this is to be good be pleasing be joyful be beneficial be pleasant be favor uh favorable be happy and be right okay and a couple more to be pleasant be delightful to be glad be joyful to be better, uh, to be well with, to be good for, and to be pleasing. And the last one, this looks like it is to do well, do good, act right, or act rightly, okay? So here, here's some things, again, as we're beginning to really be able to understand really what's going on. My note is up to day five, God saw it and said it is told or good. Does that make sense? So day one, he says he saw it and said it is told it is good. Right. Day two, day three, day four and day five. Right. The God looks at what he saw. Right. Sees it and says it is told it is good. So my question is. How did God view his work after day five? Does that make sense? day one through five he says it is good or is told so my question was after that how did god view it okay is that making sense what i'm saying so let's look at the way that god views it so this next word is what very good because that comes in in verse number six and this and this mayad word is 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 powerful when we understand that it was already very good right and and, and as far as the way we would try to describe it in the english language but this is even higher than that type of good. God looks at it on day six and says what? Very good. Hope that makes sense. Okay. And here's 
this may odd word that they they use against translate very good, and some of the words that they've used in places is very greatly, sore, exceedingly great, exceedingly much, exceedingly, exceedingly again. Okay, and it depends on the the other Hebrew word that they have with it, but uh, diligently, good might and mightily okay and look at some of these definitions that we have and we're trying again to, to to really go a little bit deeper into what is really going on here and some words they use to translate this or to, to define it as is exceedingly much right might force abundance muchness which is amazing to, to think that they could use that word but muchness force abundance exceedingly force might exceedingly great very um exceedingly up to abundance to a great degree exceedingly right with muchness and they use this word muchness again okay so this is this is the the reason why all of this stuff is very important so here's some notes i'm asking what was so much higher and better than the good or told that god had already seen up until day number five right so day one through five he says it is good right he says it's told but what is so much better in this day six that god would need to say it is very good right so god created man in his own image and likeness on day six does that make sense okay God saw that everything that he did on day one through five was good or told. Then God saw everything that was done on day six was very good or may I told, right? Is this the doctrine of God that we have been taught? So pay attention to what I'm saying. So in the news, right, even in most places that are supposed to be faith-filled places, I don't hear may I told, right? I'm not hearing told about the earth, about creation, about plants, about animals, about anything, right? I am not hearing that. So I'm asking, is this doctrine the doctrine that we have been taught? And then is this the doctrine that we ourselves are actually teaching based on what God has said? Hope that makes sense. Okay. So I'm saying here, then God saw everything that was done on day six, and he said it was very good. May I told, right? And I'm asking again, is this the doctrine that God of God that we have been taught? Is this the doctrine of God that we are teaching today? Are we saying the earth is good? or told right are we saying that along with all of creation are we saying that all of creation is told when we see a man right when you see a man at work or on television in politics right and you see a man in your family is the person that we seeing when we see this man do we say very good right are we saying may i told about this individual because again this is the doctrine of god so good or or told and very good or may i told existed long before man's work does that make sense so these things actually existed long before man's contribution the earth creation and man were seen as good right or told and very good which is may i told but God before man's work or effort, right? So long before, again, man had any contribution, God said good and very good. I hope that makes sense. Uh, any any comments, any questions before I continue to, to, to move forward? Is this making sense? Okay, so, so man had no responsibility to make the earth creation or himself good or told right that was not his responsibility why because god had already done it bad was absent until genesis chapter three does that make sense so everything was good or very good bad didn't enter into it didn't enter in 
or arrive until Genesis chapter three. So what was man created to do? So this is the thing that 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 that, that is so vitally important because we want to know why, right? Why am I called into God's kingdom? Why am I saved? Why am I baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit? Why, right? What is the purpose of all of this? So man was called to maintain and expand. And then in parentheses, I have steward what God saw as good or told. Does that make sense? So God is not asking at this point, man, to make it good because God already saw it as being good. He is asking him to steward the good, right? Or the very good, if that makes sense, okay? So I'm asking that we look at Genesis chapter two verses, uh, or Genesis chapter two verses uh, five through eight, okay? And I'm gonna read that. And uh, again, beginning in verse number five in Genesis chapter two, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Does that make sense? So this earth that we're, that we're, that we're hearing about here, it is drastically different than what we know as the earth today. Okay, so use you know, your, your, your imaging system that you'd be able to have this picture to be painted. But here's some important things that we have to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to here, okay? Uh, so my note is here that God, and specifically I put Elohim, I have to make sure that I'm very specific about that, not God in general, but specifically the Elohim. God breathed what he made or created into what he formed. I hope that makes sense. I'll repeat it again for those that are taking notes. God breathed what he made or created into what he formed, okay? And God, again, in parentheses, the Elohim breathed what he squeezed or pressed from himself into what he formed from the dirt of the earth. OK, and again, the words are very, very specific, but that's how important you are. And this is the process of actually what happened for humanity. Right. So just 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 track with me. OK. Man was made or created and formed by god from himself okay fish and birds were called out of water plants and animals were called out of the earth yet man was called out of god or the elohim himself does that make sense so you and i were called out of god okay so god the Elohim, he spoke to himself and drew out man. Does that make sense? And drew us out. And again, all this stuff is very important as we build the foundation for understanding, again, this efficient and effective stewardship in God's kingdom. Very important, okay? So I have here man in question marks. To understand man, who is man or what is man? Again, according to the, the, the doctrine or perspective of God. I hope that makes sense. Any questions as, as we're moving forward? I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm asking. I'm just trying to see, is there any comments, any questions? Is this is this making sense? Is this sinking in what, what I'm saying? Or is it something that you don't agree with? just want to see, make sure everything is okay before I continue on. It makes sense. Okay, perfect. So continuing on then. Uh, man, okay, very specifically, we want to know when the Bible speaks man or when we say man, what is exactly being said, okay? So, when you look at a Bible concordance, again, you what you'll find is this is awesome, right? You'll see man, and then when you look at the Bible concordance of the as far as the Hebrew word that they're using, it is Adam, right? Adam, <laughs> isn't that awesome? 
So it's simultaneous and you can interchange man and Adam because this is the way God views it. God is not looking at an individual. He's looking at a species. Right. So when we see it, it is Adam. Right. And also translated, you can see man, men, Adam, person, common sort. Right. And then I'm not sure for the last one, they have hypocrite. I'm sure that's for uh, some specific verse. But the but the reality is, is that this man is Adam. So when God is speaking Adam, he's speaking about more than an individual. Right. So is 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 by definition that they use man or mankind. Isn't that powerful? Man or human being. And a little bit more man, mankind and in parentheses, they have more uh, much more frequently intended sense in the Old Testament. And again, we see Adam. Right. First man. It also could be a city in the jordan valley but for what we're looking for here in the first uh, couple chapters of genesis he is talking about this man right so this is very specific so my note is adam is far more than a name given to a person or an individual we hear it and see it in the right perspective again Adam is far more than a name given to a person or an individual. Adam is an entire race or species. All of humanity is Adam. Do we see that? Right? This is not just a story about him, meaning Adam, the person, right? This is our history as a species, Adam, Adam right this is our origin story right i like to watch movies and here recently they've been coming out with these you know movies that they explain the origin of a certain character right an origin story well this is all of humanity's origin story so i'm asking what is our function or role as adam remember not talking about the individual but the entire species right of man of adam what is our role what is our function again according to god so before we look at uh the word teal in verse number five then i'd like for us to take a look at genesis chapter one and we're going to read from verses 26 through 30. again very common scriptures we went through this a lot and honestly i don't think it's it's possible to exhaust any of these it just keeps it keeps keeps going but to revisit that beginning in verse number 26 and god said let us make man in our image okay selim or selim and our likeness which is the mooth okay and this is what god is saying let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion right over the fish of the sea over the fowl of the air over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them and god blessed them and god said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air over every living thing that moveth upon the earth and god said behold i have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life i have given every green herb for meat and it was so okay so here's the notes i'm asking what was man's and again i have there in 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 in, 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 in like uh synonymous man's or adam's in parentheses i'm speaking of the person or species right so what was man or adam's function or role given by god what was it again what role or function did god give the species of adam right the species of man 
So I'm asking that we take a look specifically at Genesis chapter 20, uh, uh, chapter one, verse 26, where God says, have dominion, right? So God teaches or instructs Adam how to have dominion in verses, in the verses between Genesis chapter one, verse 26, and Genesis chapter two, verse number 25. Very important. It even includes cleaving to his wife in the last verse before Genesis chapter three. Isn't that powerful? So again, what I'm saying is, is God is saying, have it as a command, but now he's telling him, what does that entail? Does that make sense? Okay, so as we're getting into that, then again, I have it in question mark, dominion, have dominion in question mark. What does that mean? So when we hear it, then we may have a word picture that is different than what God is saying. So it's important to try to get into uh, a place where we can see it the way God is saying it, if that makes sense. So this, this have dominion is actually translated from one word, rada, right? It says have dominion, but it's one word. It's one Hebrew word, rada, right? And this word is translated uh, also rule, dominion, take, uh, prevaileth, reign, or ruler, okay? And some words they use to divide, de define this is to rule, have dominion, dominate, tread down, to have dominion, rule, subjugate, to cause, to dominate, to scrape out, to scrape, or to scrape out, okay? Do we see that? So here's my question. Why did Satan need access to uh, uh so make sure i'm saying this right why does satan need to access okay make sure i'm i'm, I'm rewording it because I, I gotta make sure that this is very spot on my question is why did satan need to access rada or dominion through adam and i'm gonna repeat it why did satan need to access dominion or rada through adam okay why couldn't he access it on our on his own? Very important. Okay, you want to go ahead, uh, Emerson? Well, first of all, there's just been so much covered tonight. Uh, I'd like to go back, and I will answer that question: uh, Why did Satan, you know, have to get access? Because number one, God gave dominion to man, and so when God gave dominion to man, that means that it was out of anybody else's hands but man himself. And so this is why uh, Satan had to go through man to get dominion because God had given that. And for Satan to get it any other way, he would be uh, uh, overriding God's uh, authority and who God is and what he put in place. <clears throat> so much has been covered tonight. I just uh, want to go back a little bit, if I could, and, and possibly begin to talk about a couple of things. That I think some points that you've made and brought out. I think they're very important. Number one is we want to look at because as we are talking about the uh, what is it the topic that we're on here, uh, Corey is I'm sorry, forgive me for, for yeah, forgetting the, the word. Topic, I forgot the topic word. is effective and efficient stewardship in stewardship, thank God's you. Yeah. kingdom. There you go. And and so we're talking about stewardship. So one thing we see clearly as the scriptures that you brought out tonight is that the reason that it it says in the scripture you covered is that the reason that it hadn't reigned on the earth because why? Because there was no man to steward the earth. So that shows us right there how vitally important our role is of stewardship. And uh, to say, I said all that to say this, is that we have really missed out on a lot of these uh, God's original intent because of the things that we have been taught. That's just no other way to put it. Uh, and, and we know that one of the things has been religion. And so we've really missed out on God's original intent. Uh, intent for our stewardship, and so a lot of times we can't blame others. We you can only do and 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 perceive and go and and activate things that you've been taught. Uh, Pastor Mark says something that's very profound. You have to be very careful who teaches you, what teaches you, and what you allow to teach you. And because of the teaching that we have gotten over through the years, through whether through through a lot of religious stuff, through a lot of this escapism, and when I mean escapism of the teaching of going to heaven. This is the ultimate goal, and this is the ultimate thing, and one day it's going to be, and all that. that, that uh, me going to heaven takes me away from stewardship here on earth. And so there, there lies the problem right there, brother. Very simple. Uh, because the doctrine that was given to me was to, to get saved, go to heaven. But stewardship is, is the very reason 
that that scripture, that particular uh, portion of scripture that you mentioned, that the rain did not come on the earth. Why? Because there was not a man to till the earth. So that shows you right there. One of, that's why we were created to do exactly that and to exactly have stewardship. So through our years of, of mis, misteaching uh, and uh, wrong teaching, brother, we have really failed in this area. So I think it's so uh, profound, and, and I think it's uh, uh, very needful uh, for this teaching. And I don't want to take up too much of, of your time, but I will let you uh, go on. Thank, thank you for giving me a chance to say something. Awesome. And, and thank you for saying it's a case where these are not brand new things for, for Emerson. But what I realized is, is that we have to have a, a correct foundation. OK, I'll say it that way. So it's a case where when I'm looking at the body of Christ, I look at uh, uh, our kingdom, citizens of the kingdom of God. One of the greater challenges that we have is we have so many varied foundations, <laughs> right? So many different foundations. We're trying to build truths on shaky foundations and that's not going to work. So something like this to go back to the beginning to get the precept of God so that we can actually move forward are very important. Okay. They're vital. So I'm going to continue on because I want to make sure that I can at least get this part of it before pastor Burroughs has to, has to get off of here. Okay. Uh, so again, I asked that question, but again, this is a vital thing to understand. This is the way that it is not the way I want it to be. I'm not trying to make it the way I want it to be. Just, is just, this is just the way that it is or was right. Okay. So pay close attention. So again, I asked that question. So here's here's the question I had I had that next after that. Why couldn't Satan access it on his own? Don't miss this because again, the perspective that we have or, or the propaganda that we have about our adversary is that he is all powerful. That's the way we talk about it. That there's nothing we can do against him, and, and we have this defeated mentality. But I want to make sure that we, again we build on God's foundation. So. Again, looking at it correctly, again, the question was, why couldn't he access it? Why couldn't our adversary, Satan, access it on his own? Okay, so we're going to continue on. Why does Satan need Adam's blessing? Do you see this? Why, did, why, did he, why does he need humanity or mankind? Again, the species blessing. Why does he need that? Why does he need man's blessing? Okay, God did not bless or barak that's the word okay for blessing he he didn't bless any species or created being with the legal right to have dominion right or rada on earth outside of adam right which is all of humanity which is the species do we see that so he didn't give it to the adversary he didn't give it to satan didn't give it to the demons they don't have it no animal right no 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 bugs right nobody else nothing else has this blessing right this barak to have dominion or rada i hope we see this okay so i'm asking that we consider this illustration so so to try to try to work with me as i as i paint this picture very simple but uh, consider this i'm asking this question how does a person without the ability to lay chicken eggs gain access to chicken eggs sounds simple pay attention to what i'm saying again a human being doesn't have the ability to be able to lay a chicken egg so how do they access a chicken egg don't miss what i'm saying okay uh so i'm asking do they or that individual need to become a chicken in order to get eggs it sounds ridiculous but pay attention to what i'm saying so that so they wants eggs or needs eggs it doesn't seem uh, it seems ridiculous to think that a person, a humanity, a, hu a human being has to become a chicken in order to get an egg. Right. So, no, we know that we don't have to do that. Pay attention. The person gains access to the chicken's ability or blessing to use it for their own benefit. Do you see what I'm saying? So I'm asking, does that make sense? So what I want you to do is pause for a moment. Right. If you have a mirror that's close to you, what I want you to do is look in the mirror. Right. Or you can look in the screen that we have here if you're online because you can see yourself. And I want you to look and see what you see. I'm asking. And so the question is, why? Why would I ask you to look in the mirror? It's because you and I are those chickens. 
yet we do not produce hen's eggs. We manifest the rada or dominion on earth. Does that make sense? Our rada or dominion is being used by persons without bodies on the earth. Does that make sense? So we, we have to understand the way that our adversary views us so that we can get the correct perspective so we don't get things mixed up, right? So he's using your rada. <laughs> Hope that makes sense, okay? Uh, I'm going I'm to say this blessed real quick, and then I want to make sure I pause. It's uh, 756. So this blessed is Barak. I mentioned that, okay? And it's it's, it's actually translated in, as blessed, salute, curse, blaspheme, blessing, praise, kneel down, uh, congratulate, kneel, uh, make to kneel. And then as far as what they've used to define it is to bless, kneel, uh, to kneel, to bless, to be blessed, bless oneself, to bless, to be blessed, be adored, uh, to cause to kneel, to bless oneself, right? To praise, salute, or curse. And, and here's my note. This Barak or blessing was unique and specific for man's ability to do what? Have dominion, right? So Satan relies on man to do everything on earth. Don't miss this. Satan relies on man, Adam, to do everything on earth. He is illegal and unlawful on earth. He is accessing our legal God-given right to what? Have dominion or rada. Either we are being used by God to what? Have dominion, rada, for heaven, or we are being used by Satan to have dominion or rada for what? For hell, period. Does that make sense? Okay, and I'm going to pause there. It's uh, 7.58. Uh, any any comments, any questions about what, what has been said up until that point in anything? Yeah, Brother Corey, I'll just say this. Uh, I love this uh, tonight. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, I'll just make this statement. God is... Man is really the only being outside of himself that God gave dominion. Even the angels are not given dominion. They are his ministers that excel in strength, hearkening to the voice of his word. In Psalms 8, it says, what is man that you are mindful of him? These questions are being asked because uh, man was invested with authority, dominion, and when Satan saw it in heaven, he got booted out. But uh, so it's just a powerful truth for us to be mindful of that uh, we are God's only creation out of himself, outside of himself, that is uh, granted dominion. Amen. You got it. You got it. Those are things I I, I, I myself had, had never uh, learned. I heard some of those things through Miles Monroe, uh, but it's a, just a case where I have to get that understanding. You have to get that understanding in order to move forward, right? These are pr uh, precepts. These are foundational truths that will help us have the correct perspective, right? And I hope that makes sense. Emerson, did you have anything you wanted to say before Pastor Burroughs has to jump off of here? Okay, he may he may be he may be away. Um, yeah, thanks, oh, yes. I'm I'm back, Corey. Okay, I just wanted to see did you have anything you wanted to say because he he already jumped off, but I wanted to give you the opportunity before he jumped off. Oh, okay, okay, go ahead. No, no, I'm fine. Okay, okay. so uh, I'm I'm going to continue. I'm not sure if I'm going to try to unpack the rest of this paragraph. I may, <laughs> but I may not. Uh, so I appreciate the time that we've given. Again, just in what's being said, it's enough to try to unpack. Right, to so go back to listen to the recording. Why? Because when we're dealing with God's word, then just because you hear it or are aware of it doesn't mean that you believe it. I hope that makes sense. Okay. It doesn't mean I believe it. So, so here's what I'll say. So I, I'm not, I'm not actually going to, going to move forward with that. I'm going to actually uh, make a couple comments and then I'll open this back up and then we're going to end for tonight. So pay close attention. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to give it the way that I received it. Vitally important. So I've said this before, but I'm going to make the connection. Man's soul is trained by action. 
doing. Don't miss this. Okay. So the soul is changed by action or doing. Now, what we have to understand is as a, a spirit being, right, then my confession in Jesus Christ, my my hearing the word of faith and, and actually believing and speaking, then that changed me and renewed me as a spirit being. OK, now this heart. OK, and I've heard it, it taught. And, and it's one again that at some point, maybe we can go into it deeper, but just 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 kind of track with me. I understand that there are scriptures that say that the heart is the mind. I'm saying that based on my biblical studies, I do not believe that that the heart is always the mind just based on biblically. When I go through every single scripture, then there 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 is a deeper reality, specifically in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ could use mind and heart simultaneously, but he does not. So I believe he is speaking of what exactly he's saying, which is heart. So pay attention. So when we're dealing with this heart, the heart is trained by what you say or what i say and i actually believe so jesus says that it's not what that was out that is without that defiles a man but it is what is in the heart and comes out what the man speaks that defiles a man do you see that now, this is this is strange when you really want to unpack this but i'm saying it only to say that when you understand this reality and truth that Jesus Christ is actually trying to dig deep and sow the seed so that we can produce a harvest, our lives can change because it's not just good enough to confess a scripture. You can confess scriptures your whole life. I've done it. <laughs> I've seen people doing it. Ain't nothing going to change, right? Why? Because there's two things that have to happen. In order for the soul to be changed, there has to be an action that aligns with that word in order to retrain the soul. Another thing is your core belief, the thing that actually drives everything for our lives, it is only, only going to be changed by what you say, what I say that I actually believe. That's the reason why the, 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 the course or the program that God puts in place for life change is so very specific. It is to hear it and to say it and to believe it. Why? Because if I say it and actually believe it, it's going to be sown into my heart that is going to be in my heart now when i say it it's going to drive my behavior which is going to retrain my soul and that constant cycle right of saying it believing it dug into my heart it coming back out of my heart i'm saying it it drives and dictates my behavior now my my soul is going to be be, be trained or retrained by my by, by my by my behavior now i become a different person does that make sense so it's again, these things are so vitally important. So when we're looking at principles like this basic principle, we're trying to lay down and just begin this stuff. It's not good enough just for you to hear it. Mm -mm. This is now a time where you can go back and you can meditate on it, rehearse it. So you can say, OK, I believe this or I don't believe that you can get back in, and ask the Holy Spirit to help, because we got to be able to see it the way that God wants us to see it in order to what move forward. We can't keep taking shoddy foundation, arid and flawed doctrines and, and foundation and keep trying to build truths on top of it. Jesus said that the house will fall because it's not on the same. It's not right on the rock, right? It's, it's not on the right foundation. So what we see is houses that fall all the time and, and we get people that try to paint it and make it seem like it's something that it wasn't. And, and, and we can't do that anymore. OK, so all of that being said again, very, very important. We have to actually do it. And I said this to my wife and I'll say it now. You can look at Joshua chapter one, look at those first you know, eight verses. And it specifically talks about uh, this, this meditating on, on the law, right, of God. And it says that it should not depart from my mouth. Why? Because I want to observe and do it. Does that make sense? So the meditation is specifically on the laws and commands, the principles of God. Why? Because in meditating on them, it should allow me to actually align with the will of God to do it. So religion tells us it's OK to just confess and not do it. <laughs> right. No, that is not at all what was going on in the Bible. In the kingdom of God, you understand there are laws, there are commands, there are statutes, all these things as stewards, you steward within the laws, commands, 
and the principles, right? The judgments of God. You don't steward outside of that. You lose stewardship, right? We forfeit stewardship. We get fired <laughs> if we continue to function outside of that. So we function within those things. So I want to make sure that we understand why we're meditating on what we're meditating on. And again, you can look at Psalms chapter one or, or Psalms one. And it specifically says meditate on the law. Why? Because in the meditation, now I'm asking the Holy Spirit to allow this to manifest in my life, allow it to manifest, allow me to align with it. I need to get on the right side of it. It is a change of what? Behavior. I, I rehearse it. I meditate on it. Why? Because I'm going to say it to a point where I actually believe it. As I believe it, it's on to my heart. And then what comes out of my heart is what I actually believe in. What's that going to do? Drive my behavior. And then what's going to happen? My soul is going to be changed because my behavior changed. <laughs> But if that stuff is not actually changing behavior, that's the reason why the soul continues to act up like it does. And the adversary knows that, right? So, okay, I'll, I'll just be done. There's so much more, obviously, we can get into. Thank you so much uh, for your, your patience tonight. Thank you for listening. I encourage, again, go back, uh, get into this recording, listen to it a few times, get into the scriptures, prove the information, get into uh, some Bible concordance and, and, and prove me. Maybe I'm wrong about something, right? Prove it to make sure that the information is correct. Uh, we just got a lot, a lot of really, really good stuff. It's very important to, to actually knowing why, right? What is my function? What is my purpose here in God's kingdom? How am I going to ha have these things work out? How is it going to make a difference in my daily life? These things are vitally important. Okay. So we'll get back into that uh, in part number three, of effective and efficient stewardship in God's kingdom. Very excited about being able to do that. I did share my notes, okay? I didn't get through probably but a third or something of these notes tonight. Uh, you feel free uh, to look at those notes, review them, and, and be ready for uh, next week. I'm done for tonight. Uh, anything from you, uh, Emerson, any comments, any questions, anything from you or, or Bridget uh, as we end for tonight? No, I don't have anything, Corey, no. All right. Thanks, Emerson. Uh, my wife is probably away, so I'm not going to try to wait uh, for her. If she wants to say something, she will. Uh, but that's it. So, again, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll see you uh, next week, You know, Lord willing, for another Reunited, where our goal is to reunite the body of Christ with the gospel of the kingdom of God. Have a great night.